Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, Neurologist from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we will talk about an interesting topic Cerebrospinal Fluid and Hydrocephalus. To begin with, we will start off with the formation, circulation and absorption of cerebrospinal fluid. So we have the frontal cortex, midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata and spinal cord. In the cortex we have the lateral ventricles. The lateral ventricles are joined together through foramen of mandro. Then it descends down as the third ventricle which is present between the two thalami, then it goes in the aqueduct of cilius and then opens up into the fourth ventricle. From the fourth ventricle we have the lateral foramina which is known as foramina of Lushka and medially foramen of Majendi. These foramen allow the cerebrospinal fluid to come out of the brain and the spinal cord and circulate in the subarachnoid space. So basically we have the lateral ventricles, they come together and get connected to the third ventricle through the foramen of Munro. The third ventricle is connected to the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct and the third ventricle lies between the two thalami and the fourth ventricle gives two lateral foramen of Lushka and a medial foramen of Majendi through which the cerebrospinal fluid comes out and circulates around the brain and spinal cord underneath the arachnoid membrane that is the subarachnoid space. Right. Here we need to know few concepts. The cerebrospinal fluid is formed in the choroid plexus in the lateral ventricle. The choroid plexus in the lateral ventricle. So what happens? The blood comes from the vessel that is the choroid arteries which are nothing but the anterior choroid artery which is a branch of internal carotid artery and the posterior choroid artery which is a branch of posterior cerebral artery. The blood in these vessels form an ultrafiltrate which is the cerebrospinal fluid. So when it forms an ultrafiltrate what happens it secretes the sodium. So when sodium diffuses out into the cerebrospinal fluid, the chloride also comes along with it and then the water also comes along with it. So we have the sodium, chloride and water. Glucose is very much essential for the brain. Brain depends so much on, on glucose for its survival and therefore Nature has defined a special transport system for glucose. Glucose transporter structure protein 1 which is insulin independent which takes the glucose from the blood into the ventricle cerebrospinal fluid and the potassium diffuses out. The glucose is normally about two third of that of the plasma glucose. The cerebrospinal fluid glucose about two-third of the blood glucose that means cerebrospinal fluid glucose would be around 60 milligrams when the plasma glucose is about 90 milligrams and another important point regarding glucose is that it takes two hours for the blood sugar to get equilibrated with the cerebrospinal fluid sugar and therefore we need to draw blood for sugar estimation at least two hours before the estimation of cerebrospinal fluid glucose, right? Okay, and another important point is that the spinal cord ends at the level of L1, whereas these membranes, the meninges, go up to the level of S2. So below L1, below the spinal cord, we have all the roots only, the quad equina, but the membrane continues so as the cerebrospinal fluid. So we do lumbar puncture below L1 so as not to injure the spinal cord but still we can take the cerebrospinal fluid out for analysis 
because it runs up to S2 level. So these are all the important points. So it is formed from the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricles, that is the choroidal arteries, anterior choroidal artery of internal carotid artery and posterior choroidal artery of the posterior cerebral artery. Cerebrospinal fluid is nothing but an ultra filtrate of the blood and then it comes out in the subapnoid space and finally it gets absorbed in the superior sagittal sinus. So it comes from the foramen of blood it goes around the brain underneath the arachnoid membrane what we call the subarachnoid space. The dura mater is double folded so one the outer layer it sticks on to the bone the inner layer is just above the arachnoid membrane and then here it gives way and forms a triangle where we have the dural sinuses that is the superior sagittal sinus. So the cerebrospinal fluid in the subarachnoid space opens up into these arachnoid granulations, the finger like projections and the CSF is absorbed into the superior sagittal sinus, the vein. And here it is one way flow that means the cerebrospinal fluid enters from the subarachnoid space into the blood that is the superior sagittal sinus but it cannot come back. It's a one way flow. So this is the in nutshell the formation, circulation and absorption. So to summarize, cerebrospinal fluid is nothing but an ultra filtrate of the blood. The blood being in the choroidal arteries, the anterior choroidal artery and the posterior choroidal artery of ICA and PCA respectively. The ultra filtrate of the blood cerebrospinal fluid circulates around the subarachnoid space, around the frontal, around the cortex and enters into the superior sagittal sinus, the vein. Right. Now, the cerebrospinal fluid is circulated around this brain and spinal cord because of the arterial pulsations. Because of these pulsations in the Choroid plexus, it facilitates circulation of the cerebrospinal fluid. One more important point is the rate of CSF formation is dependent on, is independent on CSF pressure. So whatever may be the pressure, the rate of CSF keeps on continuing to form. That is, it is 500 ml per day. But the normal content of CSF is about 150 ml. So it takes about 3 to 4 times it circulates. The CSF formation or the CSF production depends upon the carbonic anhydrase enzymes and therefore drugs which inhibits carbonase anhydrase enzymes like acetazolamide will decrease the production of cerebrospinal fluid and therefore in conditions where the cerebrospinal fluid is excessive we either subject them to surgical therapy if not surgical therapy the medical therapy would be to give acetazolamide which is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor because CSF formation depends upon the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. And another clinical point as I said already is that the spinal cord ends at the level of L1 whereas the membranes go up to the level of the S2, the meninges and therefore when we do lumbar puncture we need to enter between L1 and S2 so as to shake the CSF fluid out and not at the same time injure the spinal cord. The CSF which is an ultra filtrate of the blood circulates around the brain in the subarachnoid space and finally gets absorbed in the superior sagittal sinus. So these are all the important points in the formation, circulation and absorption of cerebrospinal fluid. Now let us see the functions of the cerebrospinal fluid. First of all it maintains homeostasis. It protects, it nourishes and takes away the waste product. So it maintains the homeostasis, the cerebrospinal fluid. And second is that it acts as a shock absorber, especially in trauma when we have head injury, God forbid, the brain if not for the cerebrospinal fluid will directly hit onto the bone and it will cause a lot of uh, injuries. And therefore the cerebrospinal fluid will act as a shock absorber in terms of head injury and protect the brain. And another important point is that cerebrospinal fluid gives buoyancy to the brain. The brain floats in the cerebrospinal fluid. Inside there is cerebrospinal fluid, outside also there is cerebrospinal fluid. 
the brain literally floats in the cerebrospinal fluid because of this it gives buoyancy what does this imply normally the weight of the brain is about 1500 grams imagine if there is if we had to feel all the 1500 grams of weight it would be really distressing because of this buoyancy the weight of the brain comes down to 500 grams so one third of the weight only we are able to feel two thirds is reduced so this is because of the cerebrospinal fluid is one one of the good functions of the cerebrospinal fluid where it gives buoyancy and therefore we feel less weight of the brain and then it also helps in the reduction of the intracranial pressure we all know that the intracranial pressure depends upon three components one the brain which is about 1500 ml second is the cerebrospinal fluid 150 and blood about 150 ml so if the pressure generally is maintained well but if the pressure is increased in one compartment the pressure in the other compartment should reduce if it is not able to reduce the intracranial pressure starts increasing because it cannot expand further because there is an overlying thick skull which will not allow the brain to expand and therefore initially when the intracranial pressure is trying to raise because of a space occupying lesion the cerebrospinal fluid one of the components of this mondo hypothesis comes out of the brain into the spinal cord and tries to go out so it tries to reduce the intracranial pressure at least in the initial stages but if it is not able to reduce and the intracranial pressure increase keeps on increasing then at one stage it becomes detrimental and they can develop cushing's reflex which has got a triad the body when when there's a less cerebral perfusion body tries to compensate by increasing the blood pressure so there is hypertension bradycardia and irregular respiration which is suggestive of cushing's reflex and it indicates that the person is in real trouble so these are all the functions of the cerebrospinal fluid now let's see the normal and abnormal characteristics of cerebrospinal fluid so when we do lumbar puncture put in a needle and take fluid cerebrospinal fluid cerebrospinal fluid out between the l1 and s2 space we observe the normal characteristics and the abnormal characteristics what are the normal characteristics of the cerebrospinal fluid first of all the pressure is about 180 mm of water if it goes beyond 200 mm of water we say there is an increased csf pressure second the normal cell count of cerebrospinal fluid is up to maximum 5 lymphocytes so the, there there could be there can be a maximum of 5 lymphocytes and neutrophil not even one neutrophil is seen in the normal cerebrospinal fluid and the csf glucose is about 60 mg which is two third of that of the blood glucose and then it generally takes 2 hours for the blood sugar to equilibrate with the csf sugar and therefore when we want to compare blood sugar versus csf sugar we need to take blood sugar for analysis at least 2 hours before we take csf for analysis then the csf protein is approximately between 15 to 50 milligrams so these are all the normal constituents of the csf the pressure cell count sugar and protein so what are the abnormal characteristics of the cerebrospinal fluid we can divide it into three types the abnormal types can be divided into three types one acute bacterial infection second is the aseptic meningitis third is the albuminocytological dissociation pattern so first is the acute bacterial infection when there is acute bacterial infection what happens there is a predominant raise of cell count that is neutrophils the cell count is increased if, at all, if, it, if there is any infection but in acute bacterial meningitis it is the neutrophils which gets increased there is an elevation of protein and there is a marked decrease in blood sugar in csf sugar so when there is elevation of protein neutrophils and decrease in sugar a marked decrease in sugar it is suggestive of acute bacterial infection but in aseptic meningeal patients that means other than bacteria like viral tubercular or fungal 
the cell count is increased but here predominantly the cell count the cell which is increases lymphocytes proteins are also increased but sugar is not markedly reduced as that of bacterial meningitis it is not at all reduced it is reduced very slightly or it may be even normal for example viral meningitis it will be normal so in aseptic meningitis that is other than bacterial infection the predominant cell type is lymphocytes the proteins are elevated the sugar is predominantly normal or mildly reduced and the third type what we have is the albuminocytological dissociation what we see in gulen barre syndrome here proteins are excessively elevated but there are no cells so when there is albuminocytological dissociation increase in proteins and no cells it is gulen barre syndrome right now let's just touch upon briefly hydrocephalus what is hydrocephalus hydrocephalus are the dilatation of the ventricular system so it is a dilatation of the ventricular system it could be because of either the overproduction of the csf or a decrease in the absorption of the csf overproduction of the csf is is rarely seen example the choroid plexus tumors generally what we see is the obstruction again here there are three types one the obstruction of csf in the ventricular pathways in the aqueduct or in the fourth ventricle or at the level of the foramen mundo example you can have the colloid cyst aqueductal uh, stenosis or dandy walker syndrome where the fourth ventricle fails to open so if there is any obstruction here the ventricles which are proximal to the obstruction get increased so this is obstructive hydrocephalus or non communicating hydrocephalus the second entity what we have said there is no obstruction so it's a communicating type of hydrocephalus here the pathology is in the absorption of the cerebrospinal fluid at the level of the superior sagittal sinus it could be because of sub background hemorrhage or meningitis because of the decreased absorption because of the back pressure all the ventricles get dilated in fact because of the increased back pressure the ventricles can get dilated especially the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle can get dilated and can go and impinge on the medial part of the frontal lobe so the ventricles are dilated but the pressure is normal we call this as normal pressure hydrocephalus so normal pressure hydrocephalus is because the back pressure the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle go and impinge on the medial part of the frontal lobe so we get a characteristic tire since the medial part of the frontal lobe is affected we have the leg area there so they have they have gait apraxia the bladder area is here so they can have incontinence of the urine and the memory especially the immediate memory goes into the frontal lobe they can have dementia so they have a characteristic tire dementia gait apraxia and incontinence of urine this tire is normal pressure of, of hydro normal pressure hydrocephalus and the third entity we see is that because of the cerebral atrophy there is a compensatory increase in the ventricles so there is a compensatory mechanism for the loss of the brain volume what we call as hydrocephalus ex vacuo so we have hydrocephalus ex vacuo we have communicating hydrocephalus we have non communicating hydrocephalus we have hydrocephalus because of the increased production of csf like choroid uh, tumors choroid plexus tumors which we find it very rarely so this is an overview of the cerebrospinal fluid and hydrocephalus and i hope you have enjoyed listening to this lecture if you have any doubts or queries or comments you can or suggestions you can post it on my youtube channel please like and subscribe my youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts and my fb page dr srinivas concepts thank you bye